Today I'm at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, one of the best places on earth to get face to face with prehistoric life. These halls are packed with incredible fossils from towering Jurassic giants to the fearsome beasts that once ruled the ancient seas. But the star of my visit is the very first Tyrannosaurus rex ever named. This massive bone-crushing predator dominated Western North America at the end of the Cretaceous, and its discovery story is just as fascinating as the animal itself. So let's dive into the history of discovery and unravel the mysteries its fossils left behind. Like many dinosaurs discovered during the early days of paleontology, the first fossil now attributed to Tyrannosaurus rex was just a large tooth from Colorado. In 1891, John Hatcher uncovered incomplete postcranial bones in the Lance Formation of Wyoming. Specimens now housed at the Smithsonian Institution, O.C. Marsh, described these remains as belonging to a giant carnivorous species he called Ornithomimus grandis. At the same time, Marsh's rival, Edward Drinker Cope, had acquired two massive vertebrae that he named Manospondylus gigas. Noting both their huge size and sponge-like internal texture, Cope believed these bones belonged to an enormous ceratopsian. Today, all of these fragmentary specimens are recognized as early remains of Tyrannosaurus rex. By the turn of the 20th century, major museums such as the American Museum of Natural History were racing to mount the most spectacular skeletons ever found. Enter the legendary fossil hunter, Barnum Brown. Between 1900 and 1902, Brown, sent into the badlands of Wyoming and Montana by AMNH curator Henry Fairfield Osborne, unearthed two enormous predatory dinosaurs unlike anything previously discovered. In 1905, Osborne described Brown's discoveries. One specimen, BMNHR, 7994, which included skull material, vertebrae, and fragmentary pelvic elements, was named Dinomosaurus imperiosus. It was later determined to belong to the same species as Tyrannosaurus rex. The other specimen became the official holotype of T. rex, the very individual whose characteristics define the entire species. That specimen is the one on display here today. Interestingly, it wasn't the first T. rex ever mounted. The American Museum of Natural History unveiled the first mounted T. rex in 1915, and it remained the only one in in the world for more than two decades. In 1941, the holotype was acquired by the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and recatalogued as CM9380. Its original mount stood in the old-fashioned upright kangaroo pose, tail dragging on the ground, a classic but scientifically outdated posture. Despite being incomplete, the holotype actually preserves bones from nearly every part of the skeleton. The left maxilla, both dentaries, the left serangular, both lacrimals, the left squamosal, and the right ectopterygoid, though it's hard to see from this angle. Postcranial elements include a posterior cervical vertebra, several dorsal vertebra, right scapula, left humerus, ribs, gastralia, most of the pelvis and sacrum, complete left femur and right femur fragment, both tibia and parts of both feet. The skull elements have been removed from the mount and replaced with casts to better protect them, while all the original fossils on the body remain on display, a rarity in modern museum exhibits. Using Brown's two specimens, paleontologists were able to assemble what is essentially an almost complete Tyrannosaurus. For example, the legs on the AMNH mount are casts of CM9380's legs. The holotype also preserves several fascinating pathologies. On the right dentary, there's an openings likely caused by infection. The tip of the dentary has a deep gouge, probably from a bite delivered by another T-Rex. Face biting appears to have been common behavior among Tyrannosaurids, so this individual may have lived with a serious wound on its chin. You can also see several leaf-shaped depressions on the side of the maxilla, features shared by many T. rex skulls, as well as Zhucheng tyrannus, and some Tarbosaurus individuals. Some paleontologists have proposed that these depressions may be related to the animal's facial integument, possibly anchoring large scales in life. Along the jaws of T. rex are rows of small pits called foramina, tiny openings that connect to the neurovascular passageway in the skull. Their arrangement is more similar to the linear, widely spaced pattern seen in lizards than to the densely scattered pores of crocodilians. When combined with evidence from tooth enamel and wear patterns, this suggests that tyrannosaurs and many other theropods did not have permanently exposed teeth 
Instead, their teeth were likely kept hydrated and protected by extra oral tissues, forming firm, immobile lips similar to those of modern lizards. This centerpiece of the Cretaceous exhibit now features two T-Rex, the other one largely based on MOR980, confronting each other over a dead Edmontosaurus carcass. The scene is reminiscent of Henry Fairfield Osborne's vision for how T-Rex should be displayed at the American Museum of Natural History in the early 20th century. The museum even created a miniature model of this dramatic encounter, but the full display was never realized due to the difficulty of mounting such massive fossilized bones. In many ways, this new exhibit becomes a spiritual successor to Osborne's original concept, finally bringing to life an idea imagined more than a century ago. Other dinosaurs are displayed throughout the Cretaceous section of the fossil hall. Next to the T-Rex skeleton stands the Hell Creek Triceratops porcus. This species features noticeably larger nasal horns compared to T. horridus. Triceratops as a whole was an incredibly robust animal. You can see this in the massive pelvis and the thick, heavily built limb bones. If you've ever heard someone say, I'm not fat, just big boned, well, that's Triceratops. It's a solid, tank-like animal that you definitely wouldn't want to mess with. Several hadrosaur specimens are also on display, including Parasaurolophus and Corythosaurus skull elements, many of which are cast based on Carnegie's own fossil collections. The Corythosaurus skeleton here represents a young Lambiosaur, one of the two major groups of hadrosaurs, the classic duck-billed dinosaurs. Lambiosaurs had long legs, and this juvenile is especially leggy. Its tibia are actually longer than the femur, making young hadrosaurs good runners, large muscles anchored to its deep tail, attached to the well-developed fourth trochanter on the femur, helping pull the leg back powerfully during each stride. Overall, its proportions are almost reminiscent of a large deer or antelope. Other late Cretaceous dinosaurs on display around the hall include Pachycephalosaurus and several Ceratopsian skulls, showcasing the remarkable diversity of their headgear. The next dinosaur is one I had never seen in person before, a true Hell Creek specialty, Anzu Wiley. Anzu is a large oviraptorosaur from the Hell Creek formation that lived alongside Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops. It had large forearms, long slender legs, and a relatively short tail. Overall, it resembles an enormous chicken more than a typical theropod. With its tall crest, much like a cassowary's, and its likely full feather covering, Anzu stands out as one of the most bird-like dinosaurs of its ecosystem. One of the most precious fossils on display in the hall is a beautifully preserved piece of hadrosaur skin. Each tiny polygonal scale is preserved in stunning detail, offering a rare glimpse into the true appearance of these animals in life. Before wrapping up this video, I want to highlight a dinosaur that has recently been resurrected in paleontology, Nano Tyrannus. A cast of the famous specimen Jane is displayed in the gift shop just outside the dinosaur hall. Nano Tyrannus was originally based on a nearly complete skull. CMNH7541, first described by Gilmore as a species of Gorgosaurus. After re-examination by Robert Baker, Phil Curry, and Michael Williams, it was reclassified as a new genus and species, Nano Tyrannus lancensis. Later, Thomas Carr argued the specimen was immature, leading many paleontologists to consider it a juvenile T. rex. However, recent research has made convincing arguments that Nanotyrannus was a distinct species, not merely a young T. rex. I was able to observe firsthand several features that separate it from Tyrannosaurus, including a unique sinus opening on the quadratojugal bone. This specimen right here ultimately became a newly named species, Nanotyrannus lutheus, a surprising rediscovery that hints at greater theropod diversity in the Hell Creek formation than previously recognized. At a glance, the most striking feature of Nanotyrannus is its extraordinarily long legs. It is estimated to have reached speeds of up over 30 miles per hour, nearly as fast as a galloping horse. You definitely wouldn't want to encounter this predator in real life. It wouldn't hesitate to run you down. So that concludes my deeper dive into some of the incredible dinosaurs on display at the Carnegie Museum. Many of these specimens have fascinating stories behind them. In the next installment, I'll explore more awesome fossils in the Jurassic section of the Dinosaur Hall. I hope you enjoyed the video, and please check out my other natural history content. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.